For the first time in modern history, defense spending in Asia is set to overtake Europe. China's military buildup has sparked an arms race amongst its neighbors. And Beijing's ongoing maritime disputes in the South China Sea has sent political tensions rippling across the region. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. On this edition of 101 East, we ask if this escalation is threatening the peace and security across the Asia-Pacific. Making waves. The Philippines' elite Navy SEALs go full throttle as they practice search and rescue maneuvers. The drills are part of ongoing military training run by the United States along with several Southeast Asian countries. Nearly 1,000 U.S. and Philippine Navy soldiers are involved in this year's exercises in Mindanao in the southern Philippines. We've learned a lot from the U.S. counterparts, uh, boat formations, medical medical first aid, and a lot. The training is aimed at improving maritime security for both nations' naval forces. The special about this weapon is you can mount it in the boat and you can dismount it and use it on the ground. This year's training has a special focus on new Coast Guard stations being set up across the Philippines. With over 7,100 islands, the Philippines has a massive coastline to patrol. It's estimated it's about twice the length of that of the United States. We have uh, uh, security concerns, gun smuggling, and piracy. Because of the vastness of our oceans, we cannot patrol it uh, by ourselves. So we need the help of other... That's why the um, Coast Watch stations are being established, so that we, to be more effective in our uh, securing our uh, maritime waters. But resources are an issue. Much of the Philippine military equipment is second-hand, donated by the United States, including these two patrol boats. Only two boats? Yeah. For such a big area? It yeah. makes your job really difficult. Uh, it's difficult, and uh, but we can still do our job. The United States wants better access to Philippine airfields and ports for resupply, refueling and repairs. To build awareness and develop relationships with the militaries throughout the region so that we can practice now in a period of calm uh, in the event there is a crisis response required. Washington has close ties with the Philippines. Since 2002 it's been helping in the fight against Islamic militants in the south. And in the last year, it's tripled its military funding support to Manila. And although some Filipinos are against American support, Captain Robert Empedrad acknowledges his country's need for strong allies. To be a progressive country, we need to have a strong navy. To try and increase the balance of power in the region. Yeah, it's uh, one of the factors why we have to modernize. But then we continue to have uh, cooperation with our neighboring countries. We have good relationship with Indonesia, good relationship with Malaysia, uh, Singapore. But not such good relations with neighboring China. In what's been described as a David and Goliath battle, the two neighbors are embroiled in a tense dispute over territory in the South China Sea. In early April, Philippine authorities accused Chinese fishermen of poaching sharks and collecting rare clams and corals at Scarborough Shoal. A small horseshoe-shaped clump of rocks is claimed by both countries. China prevented the arrest of its fishermen by sending military vessels to block the Philippine ships. The issue has led to growing nationalist sentiment on both sides. We are ready to defend our country uh, to any... Uh, you know, we are Filipinos, we are patriotic, and we will defend our country, even if we are inferior in uh, equipment. According to international maritime law, the Scarborough Shoal belongs to the Philippines because of its proximity to its coastline. But China says it has historical rights to the territory that dates back 2,000 years. 
Beijing claims most of the South China Sea, including the Spratly Islands, putting it into conflict with not only the Philippines, but also neighboring Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei. After a tense two-month standoff at Scarborough Shoal, the Philippines Foreign Ministry said both sides agreed to withdraw all vessels and impose a fishing ban. But unconfirmed reports suggest the Chinese military vessels are still in the area. Our requests for an interview with the Chinese embassy were declined. We chartered a small boat to find out who is patrolling the shoal. On our way out to sea, we passed most of the Philippines' naval fleet lying at anchor in Subic Bay. Further up the coast, we meet Crispin Bayeta, the owner of four fishing boats. When our boat went out to sea last week, the Chinese boat came close to them and started filming them. Crispin says fishermen are concerned not only for their income, but for their safety. When one of the boats was at the shoal, the guys from China shoot them away. And when the boat refused to leave, the Chinese fired warning shots at them. It was a story we heard repeated at sea. These fishermen were wary when we first approached them. They told us the area is very quiet because Chinese vessels are patrolling. They chase us and they make us leave. They make sure we leave Scarborough. The fishermen say Scarborough is a good place to fish because it provides shelter from stormy weather. But for now, it's out of bounds. We're no match when it comes to their navy. Their weapons are stronger and their ships are bigger. But if America will help, we can probably beat them. America's renewed interest in Asia comes as China ramps up its own defense spending. After more than two decades of double-digit increases, China has the largest fleet of advanced warships, submarines and long-strike aircraft in Asia. This rise in military spending is worrying many of its neighbors and has prompted what some analysts call a new arms race in the region. Statistics show arms deliveries to Asia jumped 185% in the past five years, as tensions mount over territorial disputes in the South China Sea, home to some of the world's most important shipping lanes, fishing stocks and hydrocarbons. While many people believe that the oil and gas reserves that lie hidden underneath the waters here are the real reason for the current tensions across the South China Seas, accurate figures are hard to come by. Several oil and gas estimates say oil reserves could be as much as 20 to 30 billion tons worth, but other reports indicated it could be 10 times higher than this. After nearly 20 hours at sea, we're close to the shoal. We've hardly seen another boat in what's usually a very busy sea route. When suddenly on the horizon, we spot four Chinese paramilitary vessels. One, yeah. one there, one there, and the bigger one over there. Yeah. We're nearly at the mouth of the Scarborough Shoal now, and one of the Chinese military protection vessels has turned around and is coming towards us. This is China Marine Service ship number, uh, uh, number 17. Uh, please stop your uh, ship. Uh, leave this sea. Roger, sir, so uh, we are not allowed to enter that, uh, this uh, area over? Uh, your vessel has entered the area under the jurisdiction of the People's Republic of China and leaves the area immediately. As we start to turn our 53-ton boat away from the shoal, two of the Chinese military vessels come bearing down on either side with a combined weight of over 3,500 tons and carrying machine guns. They come closer and sound another warning. Uh, you ma your vessel must leave this area immediately. Ah, uh, Roger, sir. Uh, we leave this area immediately. Over. After escorting us for 10 miles, the Chinese ships finally left us. Back in Manila, an angry Philippines foreign minister had returned home from an unsuccessful ASEAN meeting. The 10 bloc Southeast Asian nations failed to reach consensus over handling disputes in the South China Sea. 
the Chinese embassy here in Manila has just put out a statement saying the Philippine government is causing trouble. Is, is, is courting trouble? Causing trouble. Well, um, I think that uh, even when we were silent, uh, we were being accused of escalating. And uh, when we, we were uh, responding, uh, we were accused of being the bully. So um, those are my humble observations on your question. What started as a political issue could have a devastating effect on trade relations between the two countries, especially in the Philippines' multi-billion dollar banana industry, where unexpected restrictions on imports to China are weighing down on farmers' pockets. There were so many rejection. Mm. But uh, more rejection than normal? Yeah. Why? It's the one that we're discussing. It's my own opinion that maybe it's a result of our stand-up or problem in Scarborough mm. Shore. Farmer Joel Bayane says the whole export industry could collapse. For the last three months, I've been losing money. To be exact, uh, more or less uh, half a million peso or 500,000 peso. And it really affected my operation. I, I've been operating at a loss. But of course, I cannot uh, also lay off my workers because uh, they are depending on uh, my farm. So I'm just uh, hoping that uh, this will end soon. While the Philippines hopes business ties with China will soon be back on track. The trade-off between economic reliance and growing military tension means a diplomatic solution over who owns these waters will require careful navigation. Kath Hearn with that report. As China continues to assert its maritime influence in the South China Sea, it finds itself in conflict with the governments of the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Taiwan and Vietnam. 101 East asks what does this actually mean for the region and if there is a resolution in sight. Joining us on the discussion panel are Alina Noor, the Assistant Director of Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Malaysia, Stephen Rood is the Philippines and Pacific Island Nations representative for the Asia Foundation. And Zirhan Mahazir is a correspondent for Jane's Defense Weekly. Thank you very much for joining us today. As we've seen from Kath's story, the disputed maritime areas are rich in natural oil resources, uh, crude oil and fish stocks as well. So what else is at stake here for China and the other uh, parties? There's been a lot of talk about the uh, reported oil stocks in there, but those are estimated numbers and there's some controversy over just how much there is. But having said that, um, it's not just a matter of economic interests, as you pointed out, it's also a matter of territorial sovereignty, national pride, um, national security for a lot of these countries. For countries like Malaysia, for example, which is naturally cleaved by that body of water, is very much a part of national security. Uh, for Malaysia. Stephen, would you agree that it's more a case of sovereignty rather than economic interests at this stage, seeing as the explorations hasn't actually started? Well, there are economic interests in the fisheries currently, and that's where many of the incidents rise up because of the fact that there are fishermen out there working the sea already. But in terms of general sovereignty, it is indeed the case. Uh, and in fact, part of the trouble is the basis for claims of sovereignty differ. Sometimes it's the UN Convention, sometimes it's historical right. And so there hasn't been an agreement on how to assess sovereignty within that South China, West Philippine Sea. Right. Zirhan, you know, we're talking about sovereignty here. Are we about to see an escalation of political tension to the point where we will see gun battles on the seas. You might get a situation where the fishermen might call for assistance from their own country. And again, it, I mean, most military have a sort of rule. They have rules of engagement, protocols as how they would, um, how they would uh, handle such situations. I mean, the, the uh, few uh, cases of clashes we had was um, between the Chinese and the Vietnamese. And that actually started because uh, each, si uh, each side was attempting to plant markers or rock on, on certain rocks. But um, you wouldn't get that today because basically everybody, every feature has been claimed. So everyone is in place right now. 
Stephen, would you agree? Well, I don't think we're heading that way very fast. There will continue to be verbal tussles as both the claimants themselves but the powers outside the region are trying to figure out how to assess what is happening in the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea, in order to see how this maritime heartland of Southeast Asia will be divided up. You know, Elena, even if you take China out of the equation here, we've got these nations uh, that are claiming different sovereignty. Can any of the Southeast Asian nations afford to go to war with each other over these maritime disputes? I don't think it's in anyone's interest to go to war uh, with a threat or use of force is used. I think it's always in um, each country's political interest to say that they would reserve that, that plan, plan D, so to speak. Um, but I don't think we're headed that way, and I would agree with both Zerhan and Stephen. I think what we'll continue to see is probably a hardening of national positions because of a combination of national and regional factors. But I, I don't think it'll escalate into all-out use of force. Quite often, the military forces are in contact with each other. I mean, uh, we've got instances not widely reported where Malaysian ships have chased Chinese um, ships out of the areas. Um, they, these encounters are pretty much common, but um, it depends. Uh, but most of the countries involved there and the military forces know it's part of the game. Fine, that's, that's interesting, but how long can this game go on for? What would it take for a gun to be fired? Well, that, that would depend on who's in charge or who's, who's running. Again, again, many of these things take place um, far away. Uh, most of the units are small units, autonomous, and um, there's no time to call Kuala Lumpur or so forth or, Man or Manila or Beijing to tell what should we exactly do. There are people exercising independent judgment in a way that may not necessarily be very responsible. So it is a problem where you might have units doing things on their own. Right now, the diplomacy is taking place behind closed doors. But when ASEAN occurred, the ASEAN summit occurred in Phnom Penh, this was the first time in 45 years that the ASEAN nations weren't able to come to a communique, a joint communique. Did China do the unthinkable and actually cause a rift amongst ASEAN countries? Yes, of course, it's a disappointment. But the other, the other uh, side of the coin is that, well, you can look at it as ASEAN having matured to the point where it's fine to have a disagreement and if they couldn't reach an agreement, then it, it was okay for them to lay it out bare to the public because they had reached that level of political maturity between themselves. It does reflect a number of very complicated positions and relationships between China and the ASEAN countries, but also among the ASEAN countries themselves. Um, and I don't think China would like for it to be viewed as being a bully going forward. So it'll be interesting to see how China saves face um, as, as we proceed. That's, that, that is interesting. Stephen, do you think, though, that we will see a time when ASEAN nations will have to choose between China or their regional neighbors? Well, there's China, there's their regional neighbors, and there's also the United States, the other elephant over the horizon. And in order for ASEAN to be united, they need to be able to uh, operate independently of dividing and conquering from either side. Uh, the, the Americans, the Koreans, the Japanese, they all have representation in Jakarta to ASEAN as a whole. China does not yet have that, although they've promised it. So to the extent that the outside powers begin to take ASEAN seriously as a unit, that allows the countries not to have to choose between uh, their neighbors and the outside, but at least work with their neighbors to handle the outside influences. How do you think this maritime dispute has played into Washington's charm offensive here in Asia? It's helped a lot in improving relations with Viet, uh, Vietnam. And the Philippines um, has been slowly leaning against the U.S. Ass assistance because um, I think the realization with the Philippines is that um, they, for a while they cut off um, the U.S. military presence and so forth, but they found that they haven't been able to build an effective military force without U.S. assistance. I think the U.S. is trying to see how best it can help um, the Philippines' capacity build, but not in a way to make it uh, too confident enough to take on China or escalate the situation. And um, one thing we have also should bear in mind is that some of the U.S. concerns with the Philippines, are some of the key programs such as the Coast Watch Assistance Program, are all dedicated towards anti-terrorism and counter-insurgency rather than China. The United States has to be careful not to 
allow itself to be dragged into particular confrontations with China by people who are too emboldened. Uh, and so I think there, there needs to be a, a balancing act both from the United States and from the claimant side. Uh, in the most but do you think the United States wants to get involved in these maritime disputes? Do they want, I mean, they're trying to increase their influence here in this region. No, the U.S. has been very consistent that it expects a multilateral uh, peaceful resolution. Not them particularly, but that some uh, uh, ASEAN or the U.N. Convention and, and so on be the basis for that kind of settlement. The problem is, of course, that the Chinese side doesn't believe in those particularly multilateral and wants to continue with its bilateral relations. Alina, do you see a time when Asian countries, or particularly ASEAN members, will have to choose between Washington or China? I think some of that is going on right now in, in certain areas, particularly um, in, in the security sphere. But I think what's important to remember is that it's not a, it's not a single layered situation. Um, you know, while there may be tiffs with China and the South China Sea issue, you have to remember that trade underpins a lot of the relationship between ASEAN countries and China. So the, the whole environment is so very complex. So will it complex. come to a situation where, where nations and governments will have to choose between military protection or economic trade? I don't think it's possible. I think because of the way linkages are formed these days, it's going to be a very complex thing to untangle between you know, military issues, economic issues, and I think countries will have to make uh, a judgment based on some amount of balancing uh, of powers between the two. What do you think it would take, Zirhan, for countries, nations, governments to come to an agreement? I suppose uh, you, could say, you could say it would depend on the political leaders um, leading it. And when you say it depends on the political leaders, I have to say that I think the 21st century has, has clearly shown that throughout the world, um, well, we're not getting the kind of quality political leaders, I mean, to, to handle such a situation. And again, again, it's hard to say how, how things would evolve down the future. I mean, would the world become more nationalistic or or less nationalistic. I mean, and different countries have different reactions. Like in Malaysia, very few people hear of the Spratly Islands. In fact, not, not many people care about it. But in China, there's a great response about the Nansha Island and so forth. And again, again, sometimes it depends on how much the government wants to listen to public sentiment. And I don't think it'll be resolved. I think it'll be, it'll be dragging on and on and on. Um, I mean, there's nobody really to, to really tell everyone, OK, sit down, have a settlement. And um, you'll keep a lot of people in this, uh, in this uh, industry going. Uh, exactly, busy. exactly. Stephen, you know, I want to pick up on something Zerhan just said there. Perhaps it's not in anybody's interest to get a resolution because you can always use this, uh, the maritime disputes as a nationalist uh, issue to whip up nationalist sentiment as a distraction to whatever's happening in domestic. They're interested in managing the issue, not, I mean, there is unlikely to be a resolution, but what kind of confidence building measures can be done, what kind of incremental diplomacy can be accomplished in order to increase communications, reduce the chance of unintended incidents and the like. And I think that's the way we'll be going forward rather than resolution anytime soon. I think the issue is time, whether countries can afford to wait. Some countries may afford to wait longer than others, if you take the region as a whole, it's a, it's a fast-rising region, lots of dynamic competition going on, and of course, you know, the rush for resources is always in the forefront of these countries' minds. Um, can Malaysia afford to sit back and wait? Can China afford to sit back and wait? China may be a little more than some of the smaller Southeast Asian countries, but I think at the end of the day, it really does depend on time. And I think we have, we have to look also, actually, when we talk about claims to the Spratly Island, each country has a different set of claims. China claims all of it. Malaysia claims certain portions of it which overlaps with the Vietnamese claim. And the Vietnamese also have claims which overlap with um, the Philippines and the Mal Malaysia and so forth. So again, again, some, there have been uh, proposals by some countries about joint development and Malaysia and Vietnam uh, have been um, trying to hammer some kind of agreement on joint development. But I think, the, again, the biggest problem is, of course, because China claims everything and it's an all or nothing approach on China. So unless the Chinese can somewhat moderate their approach to it, then we might see a possible res resolution. 
Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this edition of 101 East. You can always follow the program through our website, podcast, Facebook and Twitter. From all the team, thanks for watching.